Today's scripture reading is in Romans 10, 5 through 10. <clears throat> Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth. And in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So be it. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise your holy name. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship today. May your spirit fill this place, Lord. May we hear your words. May we apply them to our lives. May we be obedient in our worship to you, O Father. For you deserve all glory, praise, and honor. And we just thank you and praise you that you would send your son to die to redeem us back to a right relationship with you. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. A couple more announcements that failed to put in the bulletin. Jacob made me aware because I didn't realize it was this Saturday already. Our car cutting is this Saturday. So if you are involved in that, if you want to race, if you want to come help us, um, Saturday at 9, 9, we have our first car cutting. Okay. Also, if you notice up here in the front, there's some Bible guides. If you're following a long reading, this little book is a little brief book that you can keep in your car that just gives you one little page about each book of the Bible to give you a little background. This other book goes in a little deeper. So I don't know, I kind of had in mind the people that just were interested would take these and the people that were reading along would take these also. Just thinking maybe that's the case. And if you haven't been following along with us, then you realize, if, if you have been following along with us, you realize that we're halfway through Numbers now. And there's probably a lot of things in Numbers that you've read that you're saying, I don't understand some of this. But it all adds up, right, Kim? Where's our title? It's kind of a play on words. Numbers, the book of Numbers, it all adds up. It all points to Jesus Christ. It points to a righteous, holy God who loves people and wants them to be in a right relationship with Him. But He is a holy and just God. So we have to be cleansed. We have to be made right so that we can come into His presence. And praise be to God that we as the church, as believers, have been cleansed once and for all by the blood of Jesus Christ. All these things that you read about in the Old Testament... We don't have to do all of those things anymore because Christ died once and for all for all of our sins. So if you are reading along, you read from chapter 3 in Numbers this week and you'll get to Numbers chapter 20 today. And I'm going to kind of go over those so you can catch up if you haven't been. And I've been challenging you and challenging you to read along with us. Maybe you haven't taken that challenge yet. Maybe you said, I just don't have time. First of all, Jacob, that's what you call that, a lame excuse. Remember when you preached about that? Because you do have time. And even Jesus said that man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
I don't know about you, but an average meal takes me about 15 minutes. So if I skipped a meal during the day, which I could definitely do, <laughs> I'd have time to read my Bible. Mm -hmm. It reads it to me in the 15 minutes it takes me to get from my house to three miles. You're done. Yep, while you're driving the car and whatever. Yeah, John, he's not here today, but he says he's been listening on his electric Bible. That's what he calls it. So there are tons of ways. So whenever I hear you say that I don't have time, let me tell you this, as your shepherd, your pastor, that is a lame excuse. And if I realize that, what do you think God is saying? And as you're reading through this, you can see that He is a holy, righteous God that demands His people to be obedient to Him. You see that through and through. If you're reading, you even see there's three little verses that stuck out, and we'll talk about that just briefly in a little bit, where a man was condemned to death for picking up sticks. Do you remember that part? And it's kind of just stuck out there. You're like, where did these three verses come from? But as you're reading them as a whole, you can see that, let's see, the Israelites have already disobeyed command number one, command number two, command number three, command number four, which the people said, what should we do with this man? God was clear with what we're supposed to do. If a man did work on the Sabbath, then he did not respect the Lord as God and he should be stoned to death. Wow. But Jesus even said that he's Lord of the Sabbath. And Paul even said one day doesn't matter over another because Jesus Christ has come to fulfill the law. Not to put away with the law, but to fulfill the law. The freedom that we have in Christ to worship God or to not worship God. The God that's the same in the Old Testament, holy and righteous, deserving of our praise and honor, or we can just say, eh, He's God and that's okay. Choice is up to us. The choice is up to each one of us. We have a choice to choose as we see coming up to choose life or death, blessings or cursings. It's up to us what we decide. So you should get up to Numbers chapter 20 today. And I want to briefly go through some of the chapters that we read this week. You read about the Levites and their duties and what they had to do involving the temple. Remember, this is important because God has come to dwell with His people. Ha! They had to build a tabernacle. We had all these rules and regulations, and we had the duties of the priests and the Levites and everything. Where is the temple of God now? It doesn't reside in a tabernacle. It resides inside of us. How much more we need to look at those cleansing rituals and everything else to understand that God Himself resides in us. Even more reason to keep ourselves clean, to be a holy, righteous people. God doesn't live in a tent inside the tabernacle with earth, earthly priests taking the sacrifices because Jesus Christ once and for all died for us and we are a holy people. The temple of God. Think about that and apply that to everything that you've been reading. When you made it to chapter 5, you read about this thing called jealousy offerings. And that probably stuck out in your mind too when you read that. You're like, a man could simply accuse his wife of being unfaithful. And the wife had no say-so in it whatsoever. She had to prove her innocence and come for the priest and everything. What? That's fem uh, racist, is it not? Not racist, feminist, right? Sexist. Sexist. I'll get the right word out in a minute. Thank you. Why in the world would a woman have to just do that? That makes no sense to me. Unless I'm reading and I'm asking God to speak to me and I realize that God is a jealous God if I'm reading this along with this. And He is jealous for our love and affection. He doesn't want us to be unfaithful to Him with other gods. Makes a little more sense now, doesn't it? He is a God that loves us so much and He longs for our love and affection back. In Numbers 5, verse 6, it reads this way, Say to the Israelites, Any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty. 
Guilty of what? When I wrong someone else, what am I guilty of? I'm guilty of sinning against the Lord. James says, when I pick people because of whatever that benefits they can give me or because of their status or anything else, am I not showing favoritism to God's children? Because Jesus Christ died for each and every one. How could I ever point fingers at someone else? And we were all enemies. We we're all sinners who deserve the wrath of God. But instead, Jesus Christ took the wrath of God on His shoulders so that we could be adopted into sonship and daughtership of the Most High. That we could be children of God. That we could have the temple in our bodies ourselves. That we could be the priests sharing the word to the rest of the world. A light in the darkness. <clears throat> Unfaithfulness kind of takes a little different stance when you look at it that way. And we have to cleanse ourselves. We have to stay faithful. We have to show no signs whatsoever of lusts towards another God. Because our God is the God of all creation and deserves all respect, all honor, all worship. You remember the top ten commandments, right? Exodus 20, verse 5, it says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If any of you men come and start hitting on my wife, I'm going to be jealous. <laughs> That's not, I'm not going to tolerate that. Because she's my wife. How much more is God jealous of your devotion, of your worship, of your praise, of your thankfulness for all the things that He has done? Don't forget the rest of that verse either. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents. Ah, oh, that doesn't seem fair either, does it? Well, it's what God says whether it's fair or not. Punishing the children for the sin of their parents. Hmm... Maybe I should think a little bit more about me being a holy temple, about the worship I give God, about the way I train up my children, because He gives promises also. But He punishes the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, who hate Him. Well, I don't hate God, right? I don't hate God at all. Well, there's a few children in here. What's the opposite of hate? Children, come on, somebody. Alina, you made eye contact with me. <laughs> William, what's the opposite of hate? Love. Love, there we go, right out of the child's mouth. Thank you, William. Young adult's mouth. Huh, maybe I should read it that way then. Punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generations of those who don't love me. Hmm little different context. Because my love is being divided against my love of this world, against the love of these other gods, to where I don't love you with my wholehearted devotion. Where I'm married for X amount of days, X amount of time out of the week, but I'm cheating the rest of my time. Would your spouse be happy with that? Would they think that you love them then? Would you have a right relationship with them? God wants our wholehearted love and devotion. Matthew 6, 24 says, these are the words in red, Jesus' words, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Do you believe that God means what He says? Do you believe His promises as well as His cursings? They're, they're both there. God does not lie. He does not change. Exodus 20 verse 5 says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who don't Love me. That's God's words. And the children of Israel knew that. The, the children, the chosen nation, God's holy people. Now think about that and apply that to the church. 
How much more should we take seriously God's commandments as those who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ? Some of these things start making a little more sense then. There are consequences to your sins also. You are the temple of the Most High if you believe in Jesus Christ. If you have been washed, clean, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. If you kept reading, you got to chapter 11, and then you saw that the people grumbled and moaned and complained again. We see this pattern over and over and over. But we never do that, do we? <laughs> we never grumble. We're always giving thanks to God. It's too cold today, God. <laughs> Not enough sunshine today, God. Whatever it is, sickness, whatever things that we grumble about instead of like Paul writes us to be forever thankful, ever praising God. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. They were complaining about the rituals and commandments that they had to obey. From a God who saved them from slavery in Egypt so that they could worship Him. Remember reading that over and over in Exodus? Let my people go so that they may worship me. And now they're complaining about it. They're longing and craving for the things they had back in, in Egypt when they were slaves. Slaves to sin. But verse, verse 3 and 4 talk about re remembering the Lord and His commandments. And Moses was the intercessor who prayed for the people and the fire stopped. He literally saved the lives of many Israelites because He was an intercessor. How much more is Christ our intercessor that stops us from dying at an eternity in a burning hell where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Then we get to verse 4. It says, The rabble, or yours might say mixed multitude or whatever it says there, the others who didn't truly believe, those who professed to be of Israel but weren't of Israel, the rabble with them began to crave lustfully after other food. And again, the Israelites, and you could place probably church in here if you wrote that in New Testament terms, they started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. Meat to eat. Jesus told us first of all that we can't live off bread alone or meat alone, but we're supposed to live off every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then if you remember back in Exodus 16, they had meat to eat. This is not the same thing. Sometimes you're reading, you're going back and forth in time, and it's kind of hard to figure out till you grasp the whole thing. But in Exodus 16, the people grumbled and complained back then. And God said, I will give you food. I will give you bread from heaven, and I will give you meat to eat. You'll get bread in the morning. You'll get meat to eat it in the evening. And this new bread was something new and exciting they've never had before. They even called it honey wafers from heaven. And the meat that they got was the same meat they're going to get here in this chapter. And they could take whatever they wanted to eat. They just couldn't store up. Hmm, it kind of reminds me of Jesus' other teachings where He says, Our Father who art in heaven, right? Give us today our daily bread so that we'll rely on God to supply all of our needs instead of trying to supply them ourselves. For try, instead of trying to store up. Instead of not giving Him the gratitude and praise that He deserves. But here in this chapter we find out that God says, I'm kind of fed up. Moses says, I'm fed up too. And God says, I'm going to give them so much meat that they're going to choke on it. Because they're craving and lusting after the things of this world, after other gods, instead of giving me the thanks and the praise that I deserve. Moses and God are gorged and fed up. So they're going to give the Israelites enough of what they want to gorge them. Now I wonder again, applying that to this world today, is the reason that the church, especially in the United States, not as effective by any means as it should be? Is it because we're too worried about the things of this world and we're gorging on them 
instead of worried about what God has for us to do, the mission field that lies ahead of us? If we keep on reading in Numbers chapter 11, we get to verses 24 and 25. It says, So Moses went out and told the people that the, what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with them. And he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him, Moses, and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. Now hold on to that and remember what we just read here because I'm going to come back to it in a minute. In chapter 12, we see even Moses' brother, Aaron, and Miriam complain. And we see the punishment that God deals on Miriam. In chapter 13, we read about the spies that went out to the foreign land and reported back that it was just as God had promised. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. But there's a but in there, isn't there? A complete opposition to that. <clears throat> Ten of the twelve say there's no way that they can take that land, which we can't. But we can do all things through Christ that gives us strength, right? Whatever mission field, whatever battle lies in front of us, whatever giants are in our way, we can do all things through Christ that gives us strength. Now again, we don't want to take that verse way out of context and run this marathon today and apply it to our own lives. We're talking about the mission that God has set before us. Paul penned those words when he was in prison, when it seemed that all was darkness and he didn't know where the light would shine. But the light shone in that prison. Men came to know Jesus Christ. He wrote the letters that became our New Testament. He encouraged the churches while he was in prison, awaiting his death sentence. I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. In Numbers chapter 13 and verse 16, we read about Joshua. You know what his name means, right? Salvation, deliverance, Jehovah is my help. Because Joshua would be the Savior that brought the people into the foreign land. Even Moses and Aaron would not enter the promised land. But Joshua and Caleb the two spies who gave the good report, who said, we can do this, they would take their children into the, foreign, into the promised land. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to go with my children <laughs> into that promised land. I don't want God to just bring them in. I want to help lead them into the promised land by training them up to fear and love the Lord, to worship Him and to worship Him only. In verses 18 to 20, we see that the people explore the land. In verse 23, we see that two men bring back a single grape cluster that they have to carry between the two of them. Wow, this is a land really flowing with milk and honey. But then in verse 25 and 26, we see, but there are giants that stand in our way. Now, how many times have you told God that the giants were too big in your life? God is big enough to fight any giant in your life. In verse 30 of Numbers 13, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses. They heard his words. They, they were stilled and they were quieted. He said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But yet they still didn't take those words to heart. They still mumbled, groaned, and complained. Verses 31 to 32 says, But the men who had gone up with him said, We can attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Now I want you to apply that to the church again. When we take one word of negative and put it in the body of Christ, how Paul says how quickly that yeast can spread where Peter and James tell us not to say anything that's not edifying because of that yeast that can spread, where we need to be iron sharpening iron, where we need to use the spiritual gifts that's given us to build up each other, to build up the church so that it can be the hands and feet of Christ. Unbelief spread. 
They went on to say the land was we explore devours those living in it. So now it even gets twisted. We can't do this. We're going to even add to the story. Because I, I don't think that's part of the Scripture from what I read. I don't think they saw any of that. All the people we saw there are great size. Not all of them. Exaggeration again. Because I don't want to do this because it seems too big for me. So I want to tell God that I can't do it. And He brings about punishment. In chapter 14, we see that Joshua joins Caleb in his voice. And, and he says in Numbers 14, 8 to 9, If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them instead. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Now, if you read on, you find out that the protection of the Lord quit being with the parents that were of Israel at that time. But God is faithful and kept the promises to the children. In Numbers 14, verses 10 and 11, it says, But the whole assembly, assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to, the Israel, to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? in spite of all the signs I have performed among them. If you think back to what we've talked about earlier, if you remember in John chapter 12, Jesus said, How long will this wicked generation not listen to me? All the signs that I have performed in everything. But some believed. But Scripture tells us then that even some of those that believed would not come out of the darkness because they were afraid. But a few did. A few believed. They gave up their lives to follow Jesus Christ. So if you did your homework, you read what? Acts chapter 2. Thank you, Polly. You get a brownie point. <laughs> I want to compare that to what we've talked about because there are some huge similarities. In Acts chapter 2, it starts out this way. Verse 1, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, just like the Israelites met together before the tabernacle. Verse 2, Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, just like in Numbers chapter 11 when the fire came, that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were not burned, but instead filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit enabled them, they started speaking in a foreign language, and we were into that in 1 Corinthians 14 in our Sunday night Bible study, but not tonight, guys, because I have a birthday party to go to. They started speaking in other languages. Why? Because there were people there that spoke other languages. So the Holy Spirit came upon them, and instead of burning them, gave them the ability to speak in other languages so they could prophesy and tell of God's Word. What if the Israelites had done the same thing? And they didn't even need the gift of tongue because everybody there at that time spoke the same language. They were all Israelites or the foreigners that had come into the camp. And this is how it goes in Numbers 11, verses 1 and 2. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. The fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of them on the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather the fire of God come upon me to enable me to do His work than to burn me up. Okay? And I would rather have Jesus Christ interceding for me and the Spirit than to have Moses interceding for me. Because if you're born of the Spirit, you are a child of God. He is interceding to the Father for you, and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you, that you are a child of God, that you will have eternal life, that you have been sanctified and set apart to be a holy people. They didn't receive the promised inheritance because they disobeyed God's commands because their heart were far from Him, because they were a stiff-necked people. 
They did not realize their identity as a chosen people, a nation. Do we realize our identity in Christ as a church, as Christians, as children of God? We ran on, if we read on in Numbers 11, 4 to 6, we read, The rabble with them began to crave, to lust after other food. And again the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite, for we never see anything but this manna. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? If we keep reading it in Acts 2, verses 5 through 7, it says, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews. God-fearing Israelites, because there weren't many that day. There was two that day that were God-fearing. Maybe Moses and Aaron were God-fearing. Maybe we put four in there. But there weren't many. They were from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? In Numbers chapter 11, here's the comparison. But Moses said, Here I am, 600,000 men on foot, plus women and children. And you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if the flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? The Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see. <laughs> what more can you see than Jesus Christ who became flesh and blood, died for our sins, and rose again. What other sign do we need as the church? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with them, and He took some of the power of the Spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. The Spirit of God has come upon every believer, and you have been given a gift from the Spirit, whatever it is. And if you seek after the gifts, there's a good chance that the Lord God will give you more gifts. Let's take the example of the gift of tongues. Okay? If you're not professing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in English, why would He ever give you the gift of Chinese or Russian or whatever to speak to someone who didn't know English? Right? Pretty simple. If you're not professing Jesus Christ to your children and raising them up, why is He going to give you other gifts? The people that came, that the Spirit came upon that day prophesied not one time like they did in Numbers, but prophesied and the church grew. What if the people had turned from their idols that day? What if they had repented? What if they had te taught their children? Then the adults would have entered the promised land also, right? For even the seventy didn't believe because they prophesied once and they didn't enter the promised land. God has poured out His Spirit in full upon any and every believer so that they will tell others of Jesus Christ. Back to Acts chapter 2, verse 11, the end of it says, What does this mean, the people asked. Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoke of the prophet Joel. You haven't gotten near there yet, but the same message. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, not once, but continually. Your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to dark and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day. 
of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, just like in the days of Numbers, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth. There's your answer. That's what everything in the Numbers, in the Old Testament is adding up to. That God so loved the world that He would give His one and only begotten Son. But do you believe this? Will you take God's promises? Will you live by the power of the Spirit? Or will you be consumed by the lust of the flesh? If you're a new creation in Christ, the old has passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You are a child of God. But you need to read and study His Word. Don't forget to come get your book so you can understand more. So that you can know God's will. How Again, if, if you're not speaking to others in English of Jesus Christ, why would He give you a foreign language? If you're looking for God speaking to you and you're looking for a burning bush and everything, if you're not reading this, how do you think He's going to speak to you from another medium? God has written His words down here. They have become flesh and lived among us. What more could the church do to, to, to start living the way they should than reading the Word of God together? And we're going to get to the bottom of Acts 2 in just a second and see what this meant for the church. Let's just go ahead and go there. <laughs> Acts 2 verse 36. Therefore let all of Israel be sure of this. God has made this Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. You can't have the Messiah, the Savior, without Him being Lord of your life. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children. Look at that. And for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. With many other words, He warned them and He pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Live a life set apart, honoring and worshiping God. The birth of the church begins. Upon the rock of Peter, God, Jesus starts building His church. Verse 41, Those who accepted His message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to, that, to their number that day. And here's what they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. And the apostles wrote it down here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, uh, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and we go on. Ha! Huh. That's the apostles' teachings written down for us. And to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. There's your model. Every one was filled with all at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They even sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily the ones who were being saved. What if the children of Israel took on the philosophy of the church back before they had their chance to enter the promised land? They would have entered the promised land with their children. The same promises here. When the Holy Spirit came upon the people, they worship God, and God made His promises and provisions for their children as well. I don't know about you, but when I see the, and hear the laughter in here and see children coming back in, I just fall to my knees. I fall prostrate. Prostrate? Prostrate. Prostrate. I do that just to aggravate. I fall face down on the floor and thank my God that He would give me the promises of salvation to my children. That my quiver is becoming full as a grandparent, because we only had one, and all these other blessings in here. And out of holy fear, I try to be like Noah and build an ark to save my family. 
Because I don't want to see them perish. I don't want to see any of your children perish. I don't want to see anyone perish. But that all come to salvation through Jesus Christ. And it's our responsibility to live a life that shows that and then tell others when we have the chance. Is our church growing the way that it should? It's up to us. It's, us, it's up to us to live a life that brings glory and honor to God. If we live a life of faith, He definitely is faithful. We see this time and time again in the Old Testament. And how much more through the blood of Christ will He show His faithfulness as long as we are obedient and follow after Him. I'm not here for condemnation, anything like that. These aren't my words. We're just reading along with the Bible. All I want to do is my job. You call me to be the pastor, or the word literally means shepherd of this church, to help lead you to green pastures, to help lead you to still waters, to protect you as Jesus Christ shows me the way that I can imitate Him, I pray like Paul that you will imitate me. I ask for your prayers to uphold me because Satan attacks my family just as much as he attacks yours. But together, we are a royal priesthood called out to proclaim and bring glory to God through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If you believe this, if you are born again, if you are a Christian, if you're like Christ, then Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 said this, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Not everyone who is of Israel has the faith of Abraham. Not everyone who proclaims to be a Christian is like Christ. But my prayer is that walking together through God's Word, through this church, through being united with the Holy Spirit, that we will be the Christians in the church that God has called us to be. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for your word. I thank you that we have the abilities of electronic media, that we have all the different translations, that we have the fact that we can listen to sermons at any moment in time, that we can pick up the phone and talk to one another as brothers and sisters. Lord, help us to realize all of the riches that we have in Christ and all the things that we have available for us today. Help us not to be distracted. Help us not to lust after other gods, but to serve only You, Lord. Empower us by Your Spirit to be the kind of Christians that we are called to be, to be the church we're called to be, to make a difference in our Jerusalem, in our Bonners Ferry, in our northern Idaho, and in the world. I thank You for each and every one here, Lord. I just pray a special blessing and filling as each and every one submits to Your will, Lord that you are faithful, that you have so much more in store than the things of this world that we crave, that you have eternal life for us through Jesus Christ. And we thank you and praise you for that. May we join together by the power of the Spirit to be the body of Christ that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget your books if you want them. They do no good sitting up here not being read. You don't know if you have one or not.